This is Las Vegas Sun Sports Talk, The Rebel Room. I'm Ray Brewer alongside Mike Gramala, talking all things UNLV athletics. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to us on Apple. Everybody's going to be fired up, Mike. They could finally, after months and months, get the show right on their phones. You ask, we deliver, unlike the football team. Yeah, uh, our podcasting, uh, I feel, is we've edged ahead of the football program at this point. We were neck and neck, and I think we uh, we took the lead now, now that we're on iTunes or Apple, yeah. whatever you call it. Yeah. So tell your friends we're, we're ready to go. It took a lot of work uh, behind the scenes, but uh, thanks to Clady and Doug for uh, making it happen here under the hood at the Sun. And, uh, Mike, you were uh, the only media member uh, – outside of Fox 5, of course, uh, who d- does the coaches show in Colorado for the Rebel football team's uh, season uh, finale against Air Force. And what do you know? Uh, I wrote during the San Diego State game about how the team has always had this uh, this great premium effort. And because of that, uh, it's a good sign moving forward that the, the coach who, despite winning two games, has got his players' attention and they're playing for him. And then they go out in the last game of the season, nothing to play for, and their effort certainly uh, resembled that. You know what? It's funny. I was actually thinking about that story that you wrote while I was up in uh, Colorado waiting for that game to start because I there were two sort of opposing trains of thought sort of going through my head. One was what you wrote, which is, This is a team that has not given up all year. They've had plenty of opportunities where they've lost really heartbreaking games and you kind of expected them. We're like, well, they're going to come out flat next week, definitely because the season's over and they keep losing these tough games. They're going to give up at some point. And they never really did. You know, they slept, walked through that game at Reno, but then they bounced back and they played hard. They won a couple games. So you kind of figured like, this is a team that's going to show up and play hard and that's their thing. And then I had this other thought that was just on the taking up 50% of my brain, which is you're two and nine. You want the season to be over. The very last team that you want to play in that situation is on the road in the cold at air force, where they're going to run that triple option at you for, you know, three and a half hours. Cause that's such a pain to defend. And it's like, you have to be so disciplined mentally. You have to be so physically tough. Like you re- you can't go in there with half effort and expect to, to hold up against that option because they, they will grind you down and you will be demoralized. Like it's an, it's an offense that demoralizes you. And so I had those two things, like it's a perfect spot for a team to give up, but UNLV has not given up all season. And I think uh, the, the quit, the, the quitting side of them kind of won out before that game. Um, but I did think about what you wrote and how much shine does this take off of the seat? Like the good stuff that they did, you know, they went two and one, you know, in the final month until this game, it seemed like they had optimism and momentum going into the off season. How much does this loss kind of change the way you think about that for the next six months? Yeah. And, and that's the thing you've really got to challenge yourself to, to look past the loss. Um, it, the air force game is the, the last we've seen in the team. We've got a bad taste in our mouth. Um, and, you know, despite two and one, and it was a great two and one, right? You, you beat Hawaii, you beat New Mexico. Even the one was even the one was impressive. You hung with San Diego State, and if you know if you get a couple touchdowns in the red zone, maybe that one even goes differently. So it was yeah, a, a with, good stretch. With your backup quarterback, you hung with San Diego State, and then just to go out and have such a poor effort um, game, I, I think you you it goes back to. I, I don't know if it changes the narrative for year three where you got to win. I mean, this is not. Uh, You've got to show tangible improvements. You got to get to a bowl, at least be five and seven, and be knocking on the door, um, similar to how Tony was a few years ago. But you can't do this two win um, thing again. And what also doesn't change is you still have got the same questions: Who's your quarterback going to be? Who's your running back going to be? And now all of a sudden, your defense, uh, which is always a work in progress here. 36 hours after the bus lands or the, the plane lands from Colorado, the best player, uh, Jacoby uh, Windman. Windman is in the portal and he had like 120 tackles for you. He was your defense, not just this year, but the last year. So now you got to rebuild the roster without probably your best 
returning player. Um, you knew UNLV was going to have to get aggressive in the transfer portal. Now they're really going to have to notch it up. Yeah, the, that was going to be – I was going to bring that up next because um, the, the loss sort of puts a bad taste in your mouth. And then to have your best player, your best overall player on the roster, offense, defense, special teams, um, just – go in the transfer portal like that. Like as soon as the season ends, his name is in there, which to me, the way I read that is Jacoby Winman is a very good player who could play at a lot of schools. He can probably choose his ticket at this point, go pretty much anywhere he wants. He doesn't think you, you, you're saying you've got to be five and seven. You've got to be in a bowl game. You've got to be knocking on the door. Jacoby Winman doesn't think you're going to do that next year. That's a guy with very inside knowledge of the program. He sees what's going on. He sees the, which way you're trending. He sees the coaching staff. He sees the talent on the roster. He knows the talent coming in. And he says, we're not making a bowl game. We're not going to be good next year. I want to go somewhere where I'm on a good team. Now, I don't know that from – that's not what he said. That's not for me talking to him. But that's the way I read it. It's when you put your name in the portal that quickly. So that's kind of a the opposite of a vote of confidence from your best player. That, that's his handler saying, hey – you're good enough to play in a power five conference. Uh, you got a chance to go to the league and let's get in right away. So you could get this done and be there for spring ball to compete for a spot. That doesn't change the narrative that he doesn't think UNLV is that good, but it could also be a, 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 a case where his handlers are like, okay, let's, let's get into power five. Let's get some more exposure. Let's play you know, in front of some fans or on national TV. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, and it just adds to, you mentioned, you know, they've got two giant holes on offense. They need a running back. Charles Williams had, you know, 250 carries this year. Um, The next three guys, I'm looking at the stats, like the next three guys with the most carries on the team after him were your three quarterbacks. You know, your backup running back, Courtney Reese, had 14 carries all season. So this is a team that goes into next year with no running back. You know, your best offensive player was a running back. Now you have no running back. Um, You still don't know who the quarterback is going into year three. It could be one of the guys that played sparingly this year. It could be a freshman that comes in next year. It could be a transfer. Like they still have a huge question mark there. And now you have a huge question mark in the middle of your defense. They moved Jacoby Winman to middle linebacker this year so that he would be involved in every play, pass, run, inside, outside, short, deep, intermediate they wanted him involved in every play and he did a great job and now he's gone and you've got a huge hole there too so it's like the two wins that they were in they were building towards the end of the year and they're playing well and now it's all of a sudden it's like off season starts you've got massive hole it's almost like they're rebuilding again you know three years into it um so it's probably you know what confidence do you have in Marcus Arroyo on the recruiting trail to bring in some instant like impact freshmen and big time transfers that are going to fill those holes right away? So I don't think the running back spot will be hard to fill. Um, if you've got a guy who petered out of a, you know, a power five school who came in as maybe a four star and now you're telling them, Hey, we gave this guy the ball 250 times. Why don't you come here and be that guy? Good sales pitch. I, I Yeah, I think plus, you know, the stadium and the city, um, I think you're going to be able to get a guy who wants to live up to those four-star hot, those four-star expectations. No problem. Um, it does. It does seem like running back around the country is a position where you see guys get buried on the depth chart who are talented and you can probably get one of those guys, right? Ab- ab- absolutely. And I mean, I'd even go further to say, you know, you're going to have to, you lose, you know, Garcia off offensive line. So now you got another hole to fill up there. Um, They, they, they got a lot of shopping to do on that transfer portal. Um, As of this morning, they had nine commits for uh, the class of 2023, right. Or no, 2022 is the next graduating class. And I, I look for them to, to only bring in about 13 or 14 total recruits. And then I look for them to get 10 guys off the transfer portal. And who knows, this might be the first, uh, Jacoby's exit may be the first of more, right? Yeah, it could be. It's a, let me ask you this, I guess, to, on a macro level, you already lost Jacoby Winman. 
you probably lose a, a, some more guys in the portal. Do you think it's possible that they come out? Are they going to lose more in the portal than they gain this year? Or are they going to gain more than they lose? Because if you lose Winman, I, I have a hard time believing that you're going to see a, a net positive from the portal in the offseason. I mean, I, I really think his, his game plan is going to be, you know, like Kevin Kruger did, like 10 guys. Kevin Kruger got, you know, basically everybody in the program in the portal. So we lost whatever and he gained whatever. I, I really think that we could have upwards of 15 incoming players off the portal um, re- ready to go. And I think they're all going to be in the two deep. I mean, impact guys ready to go in the two deep. This is like win or go home for Aurora. Like, so his career hinges on the 2022 season. Um, he, he needs to rescue the team. So if you tell me that one of those transfers is going to be a quarterback, that's, you know, is going to come in and be better than any quarterback on the roster now, then I'll say like, you might have a net positive out of the portal. And that's something I think the fans could get excited about because that's a position that's the most impact position on the, in the sport. It's some somewhere where they really need someone who can play right away. Um, so yeah, if you're going to go that transfer route, that would, that would be the position I would be most interested in and in seeing who they're going after in terms of, are they trying to bring in a quarterback or do they like the guys they have on the roster? Cause if they're content with the guys they have on the roster, I probably don't like that so much as a fan, but I, I'm interested to see how that develops if they are going to go heavy on the portal. Yeah. I mean, I just, I really think if, if you, and not to compare UNLV to, to any other school, but if you kind of look what Washington state did or BYU is doing, those are programs built on three-star guys, right? Three, three-star guys, maybe one four-star guy. And, and it could be done. And there's players out there that are, are looking for homes and with this COVID year, you're going to get a lot of people who walked in senior day that have one extra year of eligibility that are out there and available to come. And, you know, Marcus lost year one to COVID, and I think he could flourish in year three because of COVID. I just think there's a lot of 22-year-old men out there who've been in the college weight room for four or even five years and they're going to be available and you could populate your roster and and we know how easy I mean look at Utah State what they did in the Mountain West right there's a chance Fresno State lose its loses its coach there's a chance Reno loses its coach without a question they're going to lose their quarterback Um, this league is going to be flipped upside down. Colorado State is awful. Wyoming is beatable. San Jose State's back to normal. New Mexico and Hawaii are still going to suck. Boise is down. This is a a league that is manageable. You could get to a bowl in this league. You could win six games in this league. You just got to get the right 12 to 15, 22-year-olds to come in and do it, right? I mean, you look at, like, John Robinson's Rebels, Mike, and they had, like, Jeremy Rudolph at running back, Nate Turner at wide receiver, Mike Greer up front, all older guys leading the way who'd been in college forever, right? Rudolph was a baseball player before he came back to football. You know, there's an opportunity. There's Jimmys and Joes out there that would fit in perfectly it's just going out and getting those guys. Let me pivot quick to, you mentioned, um, you know, there are six wins to be had out there. I'm looking at the, the future schedule for UNLV for next year. Okay. Here's your non-conference schedule. Home against the Idaho State. Home against Idaho State. That's your, your opener. Then okay. you're at... Idaho State is coached by a former UNLV uh, assistant, um, Paulson, right? If I'm not mistaken. No, Rob Fennessy. Rob Fennessy. Guy was so bad here, he got demoted from coordinator to a position coach. W. Okay. So that's your opener. Then you're at Cal. At Cal's going to be tough. That is going to be tough. Then you're at home against North Texas. Another tough game. You're one and then you, 
you're one and two. Oh, because then you're at Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish. One is your final th- number. One and three. So that's actually better than they did this year, which was zero and four with mm-hmm. that loss to East, with the loss to Eastern Washington at home uh, in triple overtime or whatever it was. So if you could, it's, it's kind of shaping up sort of like this year, where it was like this year they had to get that Eastern Washington game. That was a key. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, I think next year you're probably going to look at the same thing where it's like, you've got to win that Idaho state game at home in your first game, which is kind of sad to say, but like, that's a must win for you and LV. Mm-hmm. Then you're one and three, and then you got to find, then you just got to go above 500 in the mountain West. So do you think they can do that with the roster we're looking at right now with giving them, you know, what you think a Royal will be able to bring in. Do you think they can wait, go five and three in the Mountain West next year? No. They don't, they, they don't, you don't play Boise next year. I don't yeah, believe. They, they've got the only, if, if I look at this schedule, the two wins that are obvious are New Mexico and Idaho state here. So now you got to find four others, right? At Hawaii, is in contention, but you got to travel there. North Texas is in contention, but they're a better team than UNLV, right? Um, you're not winning at San Diego State. San Jose State's in contention, but of course they're you know they're, they're in contention. Um, Air Force here. I don't know Fresno here, Reno here. I don't. Know. But I think the sure. I mean, even though Cal is a, a bottom feeder in the Pac-10, they, they still are a Pac-10 team. You know what I'm saying, Mike? Yes. And I, they also go to Notre Dame for whatever that's worth after they play UNLV. But, I, yeah, I, I, I have a hard time seeing them do more than four wins, UNLV football. That's going to be tough. If you only win four games next year, mm-hmm. that is going to be a tough season. Um, who I don't know. You give, like I said, you give me a quarterback in the portal that's going to start all twelve games and be good, and you find me a running back. I think you've got that. That's those are the two things that really stand out to me. And then I think maybe with a little bit of luck, you can get to that four or five win range. Um, so yeah, that's. I mean, UNLV uh, hasn't had a serviceable quarterback since when? When was their last great quarterback? Uh, obviously, Caleb Herring came off the bench and got them to a bowl game. I thought that – I'd have to go back and look, but I think there was one year where Armani Rogers, while he wasn't a complete quarterback, he couldn't throw, within that Sanchez offense, he was effective at what he did, which was occupy defenders – run the zone read, give it to Lexington Thomas, keep it sometimes, break off big plays. I thought he was effective for like a year or two in there. But Mm -hmm. the last time they had a guy that was like 12 games, this is the dude, he's going to be our quarterback. And like, he's going to lead us to wins. And he's going to, I don't, not since I've been covering the team. So like not in the last decade. And and, and I think that if you, if you look at the problems of the team, Mike, that's one of the problems. There's just, Zero stability. You look at all the great teams in college football and they've got a quarterback, you know, who is taking every snap, every play, multiple years. And UNLV just can't get that franchise quarterback. There are, team, there are programs that go into the offseason knowing who their quarterback will be, you know, next year, the year after, the year after. They've got it set up, you know, like two, three years in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, UNLV doesn't know who the starting quarterback is going to be next week mm-hmm. at all this year. Like it was one guy, then it was the other, then he got hurt. Then it was the other guy, then he got hurt. Then you're back to square one and they're just shuffling guys in and out. And eventually Cameron Frail started what five or six or seven games in a row mm-hmm. and he was okay. But then he gets hurt and then you're back to Justin Rogers. Like they, they, they have no stability at the position. If, if they had, if this year had produced a, like, say you went two and 10, but Doug Brumfield started the whole way and looked good. And you were like, okay, he's the guy going into next year. I'd feel a lot better about next year as opposed to now where it's, you've got three guys who are, eh, and you're trying to get someone in the portal and you've got another freshman coming in in uh, the if, if Liberty Doug, quarterback. Yeah. If Doug Brumfield was John Denton had a freshman year, like John Denton did in the nineties, 
then okay, you would you would think you have something. But you know, to make matters worse, your receivers, who knows if they're good or not, because they're not getting many passes. And it, it's 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 a bad situation. And you know, I, I like UNLV's scheduling where they do like USTA and North Texas as like the second, right? They they do a lower level opponent, right? We've seen Northern Colorado or Southern Utah or Northern Arizona or Idaho State twice now, which is like a, a sure thing win. So you're going to get one. But then they go and they they get like a, another non-Power 5 school, but they're picking the wrong non-Power 5 schools. You know, they got to get like – UTEP or New Mexico State or, you know, not North Texas, who didn't North Texas just beat somebody really good last week? Uh, I would have to look it up. But I, I definitely get what you're saying. Like when UNLV schedules Whittier, where yeah, the basketball team schedules yeah. Whittier, and you know it's a 50-point win. Like because yeah, they, Kevin Kruger says we, we want to play between UCLA and two road games – against, you know, SMU and San Fran, we want a guaranteed win in between there. So let's schedule a Whittier. Like that makes sense. But the football team scheduling like Eastern Washington and, you know, those teams, that's, you're just, you're, you're setting yourself up for, to be trapped. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And like, also, if you look at it, you're, you've got a bunch of bowl teams on that schedule next year, right? North Texas is a bowl team. Notre Dame obviously is a bowl team. Utah State, Fresno State, Reno. Um, the only team that's not a bowl team is like uh, San Diego State's going to bowl. Air Force is New Mexico, right? New Mexico and Idaho State. Yeah. And again, it, they're just so far behind, man. It's it's a shame where they're at. Um, this is further behind than they were when Tony took over from Bobby or this reminds me of like Bobby's first year when the schedule was like at Utah, TCU at home at West Virginia. And they just had no chance, you know? Yeah. The way that you just put it, we're just rolling off all the teams that have, that are coming off of bowl wins or bowl games this season. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if the schedule lets up very much next year. This is uh man, Marcus Aurora's got his work cut out for him. Yeah. Um, basketball four and three. Um had a a decent little showing against uh Wichita State where they lost a heartbreaker. Um didn't look awful against Michigan. And then had an awful half and was blown out by the number two ranked team in the country Saturday, which was expected. Uh, four and three, I think people are still optimistic. Uh, does that seem about right, Mike? It depends on what your expectations were for those three um, games against, you know, quality opponents. I think with the last time we did this podcast, um, you were you were saying like, how many of these games can we win? And I was telling you, those are moral victories. Like the the you, you're looking for moral victories out of there. So from that, I think Michigan was a moral victory. You played them pretty tough, but then Wichita State, that's just a bad loss. Like they, you can't take anything out of that. You can't feel good coming out of you know blowing an 11 point lead because you couldn't score a basket for 10 minutes. You know the final 10 minutes of the second half. Mm-hmm. That's not a moral victory. And then UCLA, you just got blown out too badly. Like there's nothing to take away from that except that you can't. You're not a good shooting team. Um, and you're having trouble creating offense. So those three games, one moral victory, two bad losses. I'm not any higher, maybe a little lower on the team than I was going into those three games. I don't know about you, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah. I thought that that losing that Wichita state game, I know a lot of people out there will talk about the, the refereeing at the end of the game, but that's not why they lost. They lost because they couldn't maintain that lead. And um, it, it, it is what it is uh, with with how it worked out at the end. Um, I, I You know, the UCLA game uh, definitely, uh, you know, puts on tape some of your deficiencies. Um, I also thought they looked a step slower. 
than they had the rest of the year. Obviously, the opponent uh, plays into that. I still, though, I mean, I, I've, I've seen San Diego State play. I've seen Fresno play. Reno, I haven't seen play, but they've had a few bad losses. Colorado State's undefeated still, but I still think that they have a chance in this Mountain West. I don't think they're they're going to show up on any night and be totally outclassed, right? Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not saying anything about them. Their chances in the Mountain West because you can beat a Mountain West team by playing that style. You can beat a bunch of Mountain West teams playing that style, where it's like we're going to hold you to 53 and we're going to try and score 56 and we're going to like make our free throws down the stretch and take care of the ball. And that's how we're going to win. Um, that style doesn't really work against Michigan, which can score 90 on you or UCLA, which can score 90 on you. Um, so yeah, there's not, it's, it's a style that I think will make them competitive in the mountain West. I still expect them to be 500 or better in league play. But um, yeah, you definitely, the, 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 the excitement in these uh, non-conference games against, you know, good teams was like, how far can they stretch it? Like, are they more talented than we think? Like, are these guys going to surprise us by making shots and playing above, you know, punching above their weight class in a way we didn't expect. And to me, anyways, the answer was no, they're not going to, you know, but they, they are pretty much, the ceiling is not super high, but we know what the floor is and we know what these guys are capable. We sort of know the baseline. They're going to play hard every night. The defense is going to be consistent. It's not going to work against UCLA, but against New Mexico, against San Diego state, against air force. Like you can win those games. Like you can be in those games. So. And, and I do think that the team that we've seen in the initial two weeks of the season is going to improve, and by the time we get to late February and early March, they're going to be a better version of themselves. And that's why I think they could possibly win a few games in the turn the Mountain West tournament and make some noise. I, I mean, I don't think that this where they're at now is where they're going to finish. I do think they're going to get better. And we, we, we saw flashes of good play along the way. Um, they did win some close games, you know, so I, I really do think that they've got a chance in the mountain West. Yeah. If you're, if we're looking ahead three months to the you know the end of the mountain West season, I would say your formula to beat, you know, number one seed at San Diego state, you play them in the semifinals of the conference tournament if you hold them to 65 points or fewer and you go into the game and, you know, Bryce Hamilton, Donovan Williams, Jordan McCabe, three guys who are not good outside shooters, but if they have a game, if they just happen to all three of them, you know, they have a good shooting night and the three of them combined to hit seven or eight threes, you can upset the number one team and it wouldn't be that far out of the ordinary for your baseline level of performance. So like, I think that you're, Based on what we've seen so far, I think we know what kind of team they're going to be. They have a little bit of upside based on if they're making shots or if the offense is doing well that on a particular night, but they don't, they just don't have that super high upside that you were thinking like, maybe these are all power five players that they're bringing in. Maybe they can be a power five kind of team, but it's not going to be up there, but they can, I think they can be a top level sort of Mount West team on nights when they shoot the ball well and nights when the offense is, is good. Um, but most of the time it's going to be play good defense, hope to scrap it together on offense and go, you know, 500, maybe, you know, 11 and seven in the mountain West, 10 and eight, something like that is probably what you're looking at. I, I think anyways. Yeah. And, 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 and you do make a good point that the, the mountain West, even for the, the great teams in the league has always been challenging when you go on the road, um, when you get up to the Rocky mountains, with high altitude, um, you know, even when even the best of best teams is going to struggle at Air Force, no matter, you know, who you are and what year it is. Um, nobody's going to go 16 and 0 in the league and uh, especially not a UNLV team that is in year one of Kev Kevin Kruger. Michael, it really does feel like we've spent the last 10 years talking about, you know, a rebuild for both teams. I hate to say it, but I mean, we've never had a team where we've said, hey, this, 
this is going to be a team that's going to go to a bowl, or this is a team that's going to go to the tournament. I mean, not, not, since, not, Dave, not since Dave Rice left. And even Dave Rice during his tenure went through, through like a reset period. I'd have to go back and look at the exact year, but he had a couple teams and then it felt like there was one year where it was like, they got rid of everyone and they brought in a whole new roster so even he went through like a rebuilding thing. And then since him, it's like every year it's a, it's rebuilding for basketball, football. is just football is football. Yeah. And that, it just, it just baffles me because you're talking about, you know, again, it's not like UNLV is some crappy university in a, in a, in a non-power five league. It's a, a great city that has, and I, I guess I say this every podcast, but, you know, great facilities for both football and basketball, right? The Mindenhall Center, the Thomas and Mack, Allegiant Stadium for Tita Football Complex. Mm -hmm. Coaches are paid, you know, among the best in the league. You could argue football has more resources than anybody outside of Boise State in the league. Can't get it done. Basketball's got the history and the tradition, you know, pl- just can't get it done. And, and and it's year after year of not being able to get it right. And and that's the thing that I think, you know, when we talk about uh, the fans and where they're at for basketball or where they're at for football, I just think that they're exhausted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're it's, it's, waiting for, uh, you're seeing it in the attendance. Like that's the obvious parallel to draw. Like that's the obvious dot to connect is that like, if you put your fans through that every year, year after year after year, they're going to, you're going to see like a winnowing of support for the team. And it's like, if you go to the Thompson Mack center for a basketball game, it's, it's pretty obvious what they think of the program at this point. They're just tired of, of the product that is being put out there. So you're, you're, I mean, you're making a point that is like can clearly be proven the fans are exhausted from going through this process every off season. Mm -hmm. They're tired of waiting. They are tired of waiting and I can't blame them. Like this is a, based on the the resources that you have, your history, what you're spending, um, the cat, the, the city, the, the fact that you can't like, we've seen coaches recruit high level player, like players want to come here. You can get players. There's nothing standing in your way from being a top 25 team. And they just, except mismanagement. It's, it's just, it comes down to mismanagement and the fans, you know, after so much of that, they're like, okay, we're not, we're done giving you the benefit of the doubt. Now you have to prove it to us. So now it's like someone's going to have to win for a couple of years consistently before the fans come back Mm -hmm. in a big way. So yeah, that's, that's where they are right now. Although I, I do think fans will like this team more as the season goes on. Um, Maybe if they can get a notch, a big win or two early in mountain West play, Mm -hmm. I think you'll see fans kind of, snowballing effect, you know, have a snowball effect as the season goes on with basketball. Cause I do think they are fun to watch, but yeah, the fans are definitely skeptical as a whole, I would say. Yeah. So that does it for this edition of Las Vegas sun uh, sports talk, uh, the rebel room uh, for Michael. I'm Ray and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you for listening.